This is the Low Level Hell Podcast, episode 19. That was a uh, quite a bit of fun. Welcome to the Low Level Hell Podcast, a program that explores the world of rotary and fixed wing combat aviation through the exciting stories of the men and women who experienced it firsthand. Now, here's your host, U.S. Army helicopter pilot, Brian Harris. Hey guys, Brian here. Welcome back to the show, episode 19. Appreciate you stopping by. Appreciate everyone who leaves a comment and a rating for the show. And of course, a big thank you to all the Patreons. Uh, you guys really keep the lights on here, and I, I'm very thankful for you. Uh, I'm going to be honest, we got a long episode today, so I'm just going to cut right into it. I hope you guys enjoy it, and we'll talk to you soon. All right, David Livingston joins us today. He's retired from the Royal Navy. He flew the Wasp and the Lynx. How you doing, David? Yeah, very well. Thanks, Brian. I'm very, uh, very good to be on, on the show, on the recording here. Um, tell, you, tell you of my experiences of uh, low-level hell. Um, because a lot of my life was spent at low level, and some of it was hell, but a lot of a lot of it was enjoyable, Brian. So uh, you know, we we must say that about aviation. You know, when you got a good aircraft that you trust, you got a good you know crew team that you trust, a good crew room of colleague pilots and navigators, observers that you trust. It it all clicks into place, uh, and so I've got some stories to tell today about uh, my experiences. Um, uh, particularly to do with Desert Storm 1991. Uh, it was a, an absolute delight to be working alongside um, colleagues um, in the United States Navy, without whom in their SH-60s particularly, um, the, uh, the maritime contribution to Desert Storm would not have been uh, so effective. And I have to say this from the rotary wing aspect is that we blinking well beat the fixed wing every single time uh, when we had to put weapons on target. Okay, so I'm going to make that point. No disrespect for fixed wing, but but stick up at flight level three five zero and and leave us to thirty five feet. Okay. <laughs> well, we're coming right out of the gate swinging, so I like it. Um, yeah, we'll definitely get into that and talk about Desert Storm, but, uh, you know, just first kind of tell us a little bit about yourself and, uh, how you got into aviation. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I, I left school, um, at the age of 17, left high school at the age of 17, um, and decided to skip university. And I went straight into the Royal Navy as a, uh, uh, to begin with a, a deck officer, really. Was it a brown shoe that we talk about or is it a black shoe? But, but anyway, just, a, a <laughs> you know, an executive uh, officer um, with a sort of idea that I might like to fly, but you know you have those when you're 17. You have those confidence issues that you think that pilots are, you know, beyond uh, you know beyond your own personal capability to to manage airplanes and fly and you know take right. off and land without crashing and so on. But I tell you that the transformational experience that really set my heart on on aviation was in my first term at the Royal Naval College. At Dartmouth, which is the equivalent of the the, the American Annapolis, uh, and that is they had a, a Wasp aircraft um, at a little aerodrome just up the hill from the college, and and each class, you know, to give a little bit of air experience, you know, had to go and uh, uh, you know were trooped up there to, to sit in you know, sit in the Wasp and be flown by um, you know a pilot just to demonstrate. Um, then you know what 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 all this helicopter flying was all about, and and I have to say that as soon as one when when you know you went into the hover, and then you know a little clearing pedal turn spot turn, um, you know, and then that nose down, gathering up airspeed, and then nose level, and you know in went the power, and you just soared away, uh, you know, and the and the the ground left you, and that was it, douche totally sold uh, but the trouble is i was in the executive stream so i had to work very hard you know to get all my qualifications uh, coming out of the, the naval college um you know to go to sea as a trainee officer and pound the deck and 
you know, stand on the bridge, you know, of the of the ship and get all your tickets. But as soon as I, um, you know, as soon as I could, I got selected into aviation. Um, and I think those days, you know, from selection into aviation to getting wings and then going into um, the 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 sort of kind of the front line was a, was about about a sort of you know eighteen month to two year gig, and I was selected not to go to the Sea King, i.e. the SH three D or um, the Wessex, which is a um, uh, you know commando uh, helicopter, but but into uh, straight to which is quite an honour, really, straight into small ship aviation. So this was the Wasp aircraft that I'd first flown in, um, you know, a number of years before that, you know, absolutely excited me into the fleet air arm um, and um, went to sea as, the, as, as a pilot of um, a Wasp, um, HMS Ajax, flying off these little postage stamp sized flight decks in all you know, weathers, day, night, fog, mist, rain, and so on. So it was a it was a hugely enriching experience. From there, I went on uh, as a second pilot then, and I went on then to be a flight commander at HMS Achilles, uh, flight two years uh, flying um, again the Wasp. Um, then I went back into general service to be captain of a, a minesweeper. Uh, you know, at the age of twenty six. That was an interesting challenge. And out mm. of that, um, then was selected into the Lynx, um, air, uh, which is um, compared to the Wasp, which was a first generation uh, small ship, you know, helicopter. The Lynx was something much, much better, completely different league. Um, yes, I say, you know, the Wasp, it had a single engine, single hydraulics pack, single generator with one static inverter, one battery. Um, the whole thing was a little bit shaky. Um, it was um, it, uh, it was lovely to fly, but um, was unforgiving if you mishandled it, uh, including sort of engine surges and so on. When you've only got one end, one engine, and it's surging, that's that's interesting. Um, yeah. But anyway, the Lynx was a uh, you know was was a generation and a half uh, beyond beyond the Wasp, and it was it's it was a absolutely marvelous airplane, and of course. You know, with it came, uh, you know, range, endurance. Um, it had uh, the ability to, to to lift a you know variety of armament plus electronic warfare gear in various mixtures. You know, heavy machine gun pods and so on. So, in terms of combat, it was two generations beyond uh, the Wasp, um, uh, and um, it, you know, and it was um, an absolute delight to fly. So, did the conversion. And I was um, then picked out by our, as it were, the Human Resources Department of uh, Naval Aviation uh, to go and f- join HMS Gloucester, uh, which was an air defence destroyer, um, uh, as the flight commander, and was uh, joined there by my navigator. We call them in the uh, fleet air arm observers, um, you know, the left-hand seat. An absolutely amazing guy uh, called Martin Ford, whose nickname was Flory. Um, uh, but you know, I met up with a. Um, uh, it's one of those marvelous chances of life when your air crew is to find, um, uh, you know, a crewmate who is, you know, different in terms of outlook, but in terms of how you combine together, um, mm. in you know how you how you operate, how you think, um, how you almost instinctively understand the workload that the other is going through at various phases of the flight and you're able to you know take some workload off to allow uh, you know we both we had that almost intuitive understanding um about essentially crew resource management so what a what a uh, what a delight that was and um so so there we paired up um and uh, you know, we, we knew immediately that this was, um, uh, you know, going to work. Also, we had um, a, um, a an extremely good um, flight uh, flight team, you know, the maintainers and also the flight deck officer um, who, uh, you know, who became, although comes from the, the you know, the general branches, um, ours was actually the, uh, the master at arms, which is like the chief police 
chief policeman of the ship. Um, mm. uh, but his his role um, during flying stations was to be the flight deck officer, the Batman. But we had a, an absolutely amazing team, um, and um, uh, it has to work like that. And as you know, once you have a good team, then who understand you know what they're trying to do, it all comes together really well. And what a pleasure it was to um, to lead that team. All, although in many respects, I think the team led itself, <laughs> you know, because of that you know in, intrinsic understanding. So a team of seven maintainers plus the flight deck officer, and of course um, you know uh, myself as the pilot, uh, and then Flory Ford as this uh, most amazing. Uh, observer, you know, uh, so I suppose he's the tactical officer, um, although um, it has to be said that, um, you know, uh, we, you know, the, the, the front, you know, we both face forward. So it's not like a uh, a Sea King or, or an SH-60 um, where the observer's in the back looking at radar scopes and we've got a tiny window. So we're both looking out, um, you know, forwards, mm-hmm. um, which is, um, um, you know, um, I guess it's it's a little bit like sort of an an A6 type sort of, you know, in the fixed wing world. So there we are. And um, uh, so teamed up and we were due um, in the middle, you know, or the the early autumn of 1990 um, to uh, uh, the ship was due to head out towards the Gulf. But, you know, going past, you know, into the Gulf and then outwards into um, a wider sort of kind of, as it were, peacetime deployment to go to India and, and um, you know, Bangladesh, uh, Singapore. It was going to be one of those, uh, uh, you know, uh, almost like diplomatic type sort of tours, but a, a couple of visits into the Gulf to, to show, you know, that we're still around and all that kind of stuff, particularly after once again, where the United States Navy and the, the Royal Navy cooperated, you know, in, in the tanker wars, you know, after mm-hmm. the... Uh, um, you know, during the Iran-Iraq sort of... Um, anyway, so there we are, all sort of kind of getting ready to go um, with a group of, you know, with, with another couple of ships as well. And um, as part of the briefings before we departed, we were in um, a the Royal Naval School of Maritime Operations at um, HMS Dryad near Portsmouth in South England. Um, and I can't remember the exact date, actually. I should do, though. Um, but it was um, uh, kind of early August uh, um, uh, 1990, of course. And uh, and then we were discussing general sort of kind of tactics. And, and then this messenger, messenger came in and, and said, um, Iraq has just invaded Kuwait. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, and then there was a sort of everyone sort of, yeah, well, what does that mean? Um, and of course, you know, we then sort of finished that particular day of liaison chatting and, you know, planning some exercises, uh, you know, as it were, peace, you know, and, and then within 24 hours, our deployment of, you know, um, you know, a couple of ships turn not one of these sort of kind of diplomatic missions of flag waving and joint exercising this was you're going to go to the to, to the gulf and basically stay there you know and we will see what how this international um you know situation unfolds we we then sort of kind of linked up with other british shipping uh commercial shipping that was heading towards um you know the gulf to you know maybe take you know the you know there was like remember one bp tanker and no, when it was there, I think they were, you know, the civvies were all very much reassured that, um, uh, you know, the UK was, you know, putting forces into place to preserve, you know, interests and so on. But eventually, you know, into the Gulf to actually get used to. I don't know if you've flown in the the Gulf, Brian, but um, it is it is you know different place. You got especially during the summer, and we were in late summer, of course. You've got. You know, very high temperatures. I'm afraid, unlike the SH-60, <laughs> uh, the Lynx didn't have the nice things like air conditioning. Um, mm-hmm. you know, so it's a matter of uh, you know getting used to the heat, you know, climatization, but also the aircraft performance in um, high temperatures and, and you know relatively low sort of pressures as well. We did have some modifications for this. So the aircraft was a Lynx Mark III Gulf mod. So there were extra cooling fans around the tail rotor uh, intermediate gearbox just down 
uh, just at the bottom end of the tail rotor uh, drive shaft and things like that. But but um, essentially, when it came to crew comfort, you were on your own. So the next thing, of course, you know, it was, you know, how you would, uh, you know, the, the need for hydration obviously became, uh, you know, highly important. But how do you operate as a team, you know, when you've got these a very hot hangar, you know, very hot air crew, very thin air, you know, and, and you know, this was a almost like self uh, a self workup that we did once we get into once we got into the the Gulf, um, and so what what were as what were our tasks when we got there? Uh, well, you know, to patrol. <laughs> um, you know, the 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 ship would patrol uh, and patrol vigorously, and other very British notions <laughs> of of uh, maritime interdiction and so on. Um, but the um, you know, so there was there was the so-called embargo phase, um, and you know where we were dispatched out on you know the endurance of the links without overload tanks, which were difficult to fit, about two hours twenty. So we were doing a couple of hours out on you know uh, reasonably long range patrol, you know thirty, forty, fifty miles range, you know from the ship. The sort of kind mm-hmm. of the the normal cruising speed of a Lynx is 120 knots, so it takes you about 20 minutes to get out there. You um, we had a reasonably good radar called the Sea Spray, rather subject to uh, uh, anaprop and anonymous propagation like false radar returns, but it did have pulse repetition, frequency adjustment, and stuff you know pulse agility and so on that you could tune out some of the. But it was um uh it was a um uh. You know, okay, it was getting used to the tempo, and, and of course, the the anticipation is rising. Of course, we all listen, you know, in the evenings to the World Service, the latest, you know, it, diplomatic interventions between, you know, the United Nations, the United States. We see how, um, you know, uh, our you know Prime Minister uh, Margaret Thatcher, but then of course, you know, John Major, you know, we're interacting um, with with uh, George uh, W. Um, um, uh, Mr. You know, Mr. Bush, the you know the president, and so on. You know, and and you're trying to monitor. And of course, you know, and that you know, we can all look back in in retrospect and say, well, it, you know, this was going to be. It was always inevitable that, that this was going to, um, you know, lead into hot conflict. But one tried to interpret what the you know the uh, the reporters were saying and the analysis of the media was saying that there's still hope and so on. But we actually had a job to do, which was to get ready for essentially um, uh, the hot war, should it ever, ever happen. Now, and this is where um, I think one of I think one of the best things happened during this lead up phase. So I'm thinking now sort of October, November um, of 1990 is that we met up, um, Flory, uh, my observer and I, we met up with some aircrew from USS Bunker Hill, um, which was uh, an Aegis-class um, uh, destroyer, you know, you know, funded by uh, funded by the Pentagon. <laughs> um, it was, uh, and we met the aircrew uh, of the of the Bunker Hill. Um, we got on. I think it was a social in a social environment. It could have been Bahrain, <clears throat> could have been elsewhere. I can't remember um, the, the exact location and. And it was good, and when we showed, you know, Bunker Hill um, guys, you know, the 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 air crew, you know, this is our links, and on my on our links, you can build these sea skewer missiles, and they can fly for eight miles, um, and it takes about you know forty seconds time of flight, and they've got twenty two kilograms of of um, you know high explosive in them, plus any unburnt fuel if you get a little bit too close, um, and you can set them in various height bands, <clears throat> excuse me, um, as, you know, terminal skim height, anywhere between, um, let me think, it was 0. 0.6, 0. 0.9, 3 metres and about 4.5 metres. I might have got the exact figures wrong, but there was a big range of, of terminal skim height. So you would launch these missiles from, um, well, it was... Uh, from characteristically 200 feet, 100 knots, anything combination. So you could do it. 
So the, the call just before launch was the observer would say to the pilot, give me 300. And so the combination was 300 feet above sea level and in the hover, in the hover, or mm. 200 feet at 100 knots, um, and or, or whatever, you know, at sort of 150 knots, if you chose to be screaming at the enemy that fast, um, right. it would be, you know, 150 feet. So the general rule was, a hundred, you know, uh, 60 to 100 knots, somewhere around 200 to 250 feet. Um, and so these, these missiles, the sea skewers, yeah, 22 kilograms, they go off the rails. So you can carry up to four, but they're pretty heavy things for a poor old Lynx aeroplane, um, especially when it's, you know, warm, well, you know, hot and, you know, the atmosphere, you know, the air is a bit thin. Um, mm. So in the end, where we found, you know, when we were flying them operationally, three was still a bit of uh, maximum four, three was still a bit of a shove, actually one either side, um, you know, would be fine, you know, which would give you. Okay. Um, so they actually go off the rails cold. So they just, you know, when you've set everything up, they're semi-active. So your sea spray radar goes into a lockup mode on the target uh, that you've identified. Um, and then by going through a number of, um, you know, buttons and master armament, safety switches and weird stuff like that, can't remember what the buttons are. However, the lights then uh, and the essentially the, the helicopter installed equipment then starts talking to the sea skewer uh, nav and guidance system. So it gets this sort of idea, right, this is what I'm aiming for. The nav and guidance system then works out what the step down is going to look like as it gets down to the terminal sea skimming height. Um, and then the system goes armed. There's some three lights come up. Um, and then you get um, the first one is armed. The second one locked, which it means that the head on the missile is now um, uh, you know, ready to, you know, it, it now sees a target. A few more sort of electronic wiggly bits happen <laughs> somewhere inside the system. But the third light comes up, which says ready. And at that stage, uh, you you can then release the release the missile. Um, and that was normally done in, in my case. I, I let uh, Flory do that and with a, a essentially a release, a fire button down by his right knee. I have one down my own right knee. Um, uh, and, and the different, you know, the reason why you have two was actually once upon a time the 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 Lynx was equipped to carry nuclear weapons. Of course, you had to use the two man rule with one person not being able to press both buttons. If you see what I mean, right. so that was the the order. Right. However, so, um, so I'm looking so at the picture of this missile, and I can see some pictures of it being fired. So it looks like it it drops off the aircraft about it goes off feet cold. or so, and then that's correct. And then the, yeah. The motor hits. Yeah. Okay. So what happens is a safety and arming unit lanyard in in which is plugged into the top of the the missile is mm. is actually then uh, I think we we all have them in our armed helicopters. Then that lanyard is then um, you know attached to uh, the 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 boom, which is attached of course, of course to the aircraft. So as as the there and there's another one as well. So you actually have a um, almost like an umbilical, which is one of the um, uh, what we call flight and air material. So an umbilical, which is sending the signals into the missile to say, hey, look, 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 it's over here somewhere. Okay, all that targeting. And then you have the um, safety arming unit, which essentially pulls the pin out of the hand grenade. Um, and then you have these um, uh, the SAO, which is the safety, oh, I've just said it, but um, um, a safety and armament unit. Which, which again, you know, so as the missile drops away, comes out of the pins and all these three lanyards, it's a bit like um, a horizontal, if you've ever seen Apollo 13, where all of, the, when it launches, all of these umbilicals and things sort of kind of pull away yeah. from the rocket. That's what happens. Um, and there were three of them, uh, you know, three different sort of umbilicals that pulled out as the, so it goes off cold, it drops for 1.2 seconds, and then you get this booster, uh, at the back end, um, which then runs, I'm trying to think, uh, for a number of seconds, I think it might be eight seconds, and then it, that gets it up to about Mach point eight, Mach point nine, 
and then you have sustainer motors which are almost like um almost like little rockets which which are built into the sides of of um sides of the sea skewer so so that's how it all sort of works you know with, with a sea skewer um and um well you know the interesting thing we talked to bunker hill team about was that you know you've got some amazing radar and other gear on your um helicopter your anaps i think it's called an anaps 124 or aps 124 low long range moving moving target designation all you know really really good stuff that was one area where the the links was limited because our radar was forward looking from the nose um essentially it goes to let's say 90 degrees so it goes 90 degrees left and 90 degrees right back left back right it's not ground stabilized so the picture you have <clears throat> that the uh the, the flory the my observer had is essentially um well in terms of avionics it, it was pretty primitive stuff um uh, mm -hmm. you know and and then you add in you know all sorts of things like anomalous propagation and interference and stuff there were some pulse repetition frequencies uh you know things that you could do to <clears throat> to make life a little bit better um, but then, you know, um, but it wasn't it wasn't top level as good as. Um, and so we we, uh, we we sat down and I think it was probably had to be on our ship uh, because uh, we had beer on our ship, HMS Gloucester, and USS <laughs> Bunker Hill did not have beer on uh, their ship. <clears throat> so we started, uh, you know, looking and I wish I could remember the name. I've probably got it in my record somewhere. We, we started kind of mapping out you know what would it look like so what's your range what's your range how do you do your attack profile how can we so we actually um together over a few beers um normal united kingdom diplomacy you always add in a little bit of alcohol to to make sure the conversation runs on rails and we came up with this yeah. uh joint concept um uh, of right okay you're good at that stuff you sh60b people you seahawk people we'll we'll be the weapon carrier we don't you can do your you know long range radar stuff with your ground stabilization you're not air traffic controllers but you know you can you can definitely give us the vectors which we will be able to do totally silently so so if you were thinking of the opposition you know you would have this sort of kind of um uh you know you you'd be picking up the anaps you know the the aps124 um you know radar you know moving around as normal and then hopefully what the next thing you would get is the sea skewer in sector mode, which means that Flory, having been handed over the position in relative terms to us in the links, would be, was, they, you know, the idea was the, 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 um, the SH-60B would, would say, okay, um, you know, 10 miles to go, eight miles to go, six you know on your nose uh, at you know eight miles at which stage flory would then go into you know from dummy load into transmit one two three there it is switch off again and then the next and, and mark you know the contact so it correlates with the sh60b um and then the next thing is you you essentially go for give me 300 mm -hmm. um to which you come up you switch the radar on sector scan which is about 15 degrees either side of the nose or where you've actually pointed the radar there it is lock and then they and then the next thing you go into those three lights armed locked ready boof so the if the target had reasonably competent esm they would get general sort of well there's a seahawk out there somewhere and the next thing they have is probably three sweeps of sector scan lock up and 25 seconds later impact so there was no way to fire that missile uh i don't want to say blind but essentially you couldn't fire it along a direction and it had no way to track itself once it was launched uh once it was launched it had to have some data from the aircraft before it launches <clears throat> okay well this came uh this did actually come to the fore a little bit later on okay so if the missile once launched, and, and I don't think there was a reversionary mode where you could just fire it from the rail like a, mm -hmm. like a gun, 
that you know um almost um like a you know oh there it is let's fire it because it, it needs the all of the range information and the height information to say okay here's my step down which i need to mm. do within the range available but what would happen is that once it was in the air <clears throat> and traveling what would happen is if for example the radar lost lock the missile would carry would keep stepping down on the on the profile that was already in the computer and would mm. stick on the same bearing okay and that became important one night when because of missiles coming the other way Flory and I had to leave a missile to fly on its own as as um a couple of SA2s um were sort of yeah fair enough um you know we're firing missiles at them their their colleague you know at a ship it was a Paul Nockney uh, aircraft uh sorry Paul Nockney landing ship near Felaka Island and as we were uh carrying out you know we were firing our second missile um a couple of SA2s were launched from the Q8 from behind, you know, the, the area of Kuwait City behind, um, mm. which, which, um, yes, they, where they, um, uh, uh, as one would say, an issue of growing concern, <laughs> um, and uh, maybe we'll go into into that story. Later. Anyway, so there we are with with Bunker Hill, and so over a few, you know, a couple of beers, I think it was, um, we. Um, we we then say right well okay let's uh, let's see if this works let's let's practice this live well not live firing a missile but let's go you know when our ships are fairly close together you know let's set this up you know and we got the ops teams to to liaise and so we we um, we knew how this was going to work um, we we'd given each other all the information and we then did it in dummy you know this is about November I think November of nineteen ninety. Um, uh, and we just sort of mocked up an attack on, you know, a, a Bunker Hill SH-60 uh, nominates, a, you know, a, a dow or a fishing boat as a target for us. It, it gave us the vector mm-hmm. information, you know, uh, head, nor- you know, head north now, or, you know, right zero one zero, you know, 10 miles, you know, eight miles, dish, under which stage, you know, Flory and I would then, you know, go into in into the uh, the practice type run, and it worked a blinking dream. So it became so having invented it, jointly invented it. Okay, brilliant people in in um, in Bunker Hill, and tested it. It then became a um, a, a formal, what what was called a conop, uh, and I can't I know um, collaborative concept of some, operation. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, okay. Which we were then to use actually when it came into the live war itself. Hmm. So here we go, and this is how well this is how well things work. You know, um, when you just sit down and think about it, you've got you match up the strengths of the the various kit you've got available, and you know, in you go, and um, uh, you 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 develop something fairly special. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was the um, <clears throat> um, some of, some of the lead up the 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 operations to um, you know count up the um, potential what were they called the blockade runners you know oil trying to sneak into um, uh, sneak into Iraqi ports and things like that you know that was cripplingly boring um and um i'm i'm afraid to say but the but the conop was was um you know all the better and of course you know we're still listening to the radio the world service and of course we had the official uh, kind of analysis from the ministry of defense coming through saying you know still still another initiative by third party countries to bring peace but we were seeing a lot of gear coming through the gulf then um you know the um, you know the the sea lift command from you know from United States. We saw our you know landing you know big logistic landing craft and other ships taken up from trade. Um, you know with our desert rats. You know the you know the arm you know the the armored division of the um, you know and so you could feel yeah this is okay it's still serious and of course through this you're trying to send nice reassuring 
you know, letters back to the family saying it's all going to be fine and I won't be close to the action right. and so on and so on, you know. And so so you had this kind of, kind of conflict and then, then Christmas arrived, um, which we had in Abu Dhabi, I think. Um, it was interesting there, I think. Um, it was, we had an Argentinian frigate was, was there in, in Abu Dhabi with us. Um, mm. Interesting that, that that only sort of kind of eight years before um, yeah. we we were not very friendly with Argentina uh, over. Yeah, you would have been shooting at that one. <laughs> we we it, well, you know, having done some you know recent reading into you know into the Argentine you know the potential of the Argentine Navy, particularly their submarines, to really make a mess of our Falklands campaign. Um, you know, but after the Belgrano, the surface fleet all sort of kind of, um, uh, you know, all went home and, and didn't reappear. But it's uh, mm-hmm. it's interesting how these these international things go. Uh, and um, but it was good to have uh, the broadest coalition possible. But it was always going to be, I'm afraid, once again, um, the United States and the United Kingdom saying almost setting the standard, Brian. OK, well. If nobody else wants to come up here to the to the front line, we're blinking. We'll do it ourselves. But good luck, you know, <laughs> further aft, if if you know what I mean. And but that's about right. that's about the politics of it. Surely, you know, this is this is about, you know, the rules of engagement. You know, each each head of state, uh, you know, each prime minister of of various countries, you know, has to put this in the context of you know risk and reward yeah. and what is acceptable and so on. Th- these are not the questions for lowly military people like the flight commander of a type 42 destroyer um but right. but anyway so, so but you know that period of work up you know towards conflict did actually start almost like a like a sieve you know okay who's going to drop through the through the gaps and won't play a real role in the you know forthcoming you know mm-hmm. if it happens and and who are the 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 you know the lovely gemstones of hard rock that are, they're actually going to okay this is the gang <laughs> that we're going to go for uh and um uh and the way it turned out um so we had we had christmas and and then post christmas there was a okay everyone now go into a kind of refit uh you know a mini refit so ships went and made sure their engines were in top line that you know the lube oil had the right level of impurities in that nothing was going to fail you know and Mm. and teams were talking through you know about you know general leadership stuff you know that you know and certainly from from the flight team because we had a a jammer called um yellow the yellow veil jammer which was the ship's primary defense against the exocets which Iraq had so they had the Mirage F1s and they had lots of Exocets and of course from the Falklands we know that Exocets and Royal Navy ships do not go well together um, but we had this thing called the Yellow Vale Jammer um, which we would be able you know essentially it's you know would seduce the Exocet into home on jam uh, in Exocet cut in, inbound home on jam and you know you would hover you know Few, few hundred yards behind the ship, and then the Exocet would fly underneath you, making sure that there were no other ships downrange of yourself, because that's what happened with uh, the Atlantic conveyor um, in the Falklands War. Mm. But there we go. So, so, so there was this sort of kind of, as as it were, um, <clears throat> um, uh, this sort of kind of intensive period of making sure that everything was ready. You know that the chances of material failure, in terms of a gearbox mounting, okay, NDT it then, chief. You know, let let's you know let's get the plugs off the gearbox, making sure there's no corrosion underneath those. Whoever put aluminium studs into a maritime naval helicopter gearbox has to be nuts. <laughs> You know, but but there was a procedure to clean them and then to actually reseal them in a sterile environment and so on. Okay, let, let's go through, you know, let's go through the, the weapons, you know, every single weapon, you know, chief elect, um, you know, chief weapon, uh, chief weapons, let's go, let's do a ground test of every single circuit, every every single box that we have to make sure that, you know, 
okay, things break down, but let's make sure they're not broken when they put them on the aircraft in the first place. Okay, so so there was this kind of kind of period there, and my team, the team, I'm not going to say my team. It was the team were absolutely magnificent in the way they applied themselves with long hours and dedication. They knew that we were going to be important down aft, whether it was whether it's jamming an exocet or whether finding uh, you know patrol boats and potentially sinking them, you know, to do reconnaissance to find my and so on. Um, and they responded absolutely magnificently to a. To a person, uh, and in those days, you know, I was going to say to a man. These days, well, in those days, sorry, and of course, it was all male crew. Uh, certainly in our ship, uh, even though later on a Type Twenty Two frigate with mixed manning uh, came into theatre. Um, I think I was HMS Brilliant, but I, I might be wrong on that. But you know, every man, and it's interesting as the pressure comes on, Brian. And I wonder if you recognise this yourself. Is that the 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 the, the young maintainer, you know, the young sort of kind of equipment technician who, mm. who has always been, you know, in the background a little bit, a little bit quiet, you know, suddenly is the one that almost through personal example sets the standard. Sure. But through the yeah. long hours of work and... You know, if you say, oh, God, if we check this, you know, have we done that? Um, I'll check it again. I think we've done it. I'll check it again. And and I remember, you know, and I'm not going to name any, you know, of the 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 betters and the, uh, you know, the less so good in, you know, because that would be unfair. But there was this this young lad who worked like a, um, oh, I, I, you know, I, you know, I don't know. He he was he was just absolutely amazing. All you know, and what he wanted to do is to make sure his little microcosm, his what he was responsible for, that he was going to deliver to the helicopter and to Flory and I in the best possible condition, which is absolutely amazing. Quiet people became forward leaders. Forward leaders, the brash and the mouthy, they became quiet. <laughs> And everything kind of, but everything kind of balanced out, you know. Even even into, you know. So what we had was a phenomenal team, and it it really, you know. And then the you know key, I mean, we had um, an engine failure, so we had to change an engine, you know, in, in the lead up. You know, it, it was not a, it didn't, it wasn't in flight, but you know, some oil sample wasn't quite right. Change the engine, boof, there it was. Whole team changed the engine, and we did it in something like six hours flat. Normally takes, you know, half a day, more more sometimes a day. Do you know? And that was what, you know, that is what, you know, that is what teamwork is all about. And there was, you know, leadership there, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, but but um, there we go. Well, when things get real, you know, that people start to step up and uh, and things things take on a new meaning of, of priority and, and, you know, this has to get done. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm just looking at my diary here. Um, oh, I, I'm, OK, so I'll just pick this out. This is just at random here, uh, Brian. So this is January the 9th. Um, we await the outcome of the talks. Every ear in the ship listens to the World Service bulletins on the hour. Baker and Aziz are in their session now. It is much better than we thought, as first thoughts were that it would last no more than an hour. I will leave the World Service on and, and, until I know the result. Um, <laughs> you know, and by that time, so we, we'd actually sailed. Um, hang on, uh, we'd actually sailed. Um, oh wait, yes, I had my anthrax injections uh, on uh, uh, January the fourth. I was very ill after that. But anyway, we we'd, we'd sailed, um, you know, late late uh, December, um, and and then this this was getting kind of more serious um, to, uh, um, uh, you know, as, as sort of as uh, so, just so December the twenty ninth. An extremely useful morning spent at USS Bunker Hill, working out list, you know the final parts of the Lynx SH-60 uh, tax tack op, 
and the result was good. This will be pressed to other uh, passed to other ships in um, uh, in the task group um, and blah blah blah. And so so all it all it went um, you know all was going sort of pretty uh, swimmingly, sailing out just after after Christmas. But then the tension beginning to rise and rise, and more shipping coming in, more grey ships delivering more tanks and people, um, and so on. And and I think really by January the 10th, one hoped for the best, um, but um, you really started to think that, um, and I I wasn't then a, you know, an expert in international politics, and I think there was a lot of talk in the, um, um, uh, a lot of talk in the, in the officer's mess, what we call the wardroom, um, about, you know, where we're all going to go. And there was this, I think the anticipation by about, um, you know, January the tenth had now reached. Okay, this this might turn into something. Um, but what had happened in that lead up was that you know mines had been found. So we had um, uh, these sort of floating mines in the Gulf, and a few had been found. And so that's where my um, sort of kind of, I guess, the next phase of my flying started. So we'd gone from. Um, you know, counting up merchant ships, you know, in the Gulf now to much more about, you know, kind of mine, mine search. And that, if you've ever done mine search, Brian, or any of the listeners have have uh, have done it, um, you know, who might have been maritime pilots, it is the most boring. I know it's highly important, but it's the most boring thing you could ever do. Um, and, um, you know, just sitting in the hover in front of a battleship or, or something like that as an advanced pair of eyes. Um, mm. um, you know, of course, by then we had the, the Missouri was, you know, in and, in and around town. What an amazing sight an American battleship is. Um, uh, you know, when you see two of them, as we did later, together during our trip north, it was, um, you know, absolutely stunning to see those yeah. B- BBs, um, you know, uh, you know, M- Missouri and Wisconsin. Um, it was Wisconsin first, and then Missouri was, you know, uh, a little bit later. But anyway, so so I think it was um, um, a little bit, you know, I think with three or four days to go before Jan seventeen, I think that everyone basically knew that it was the talks had kind of broken down, really. Um, you know, so I'm thinking somewhere around um, uh, around January the 14th. The next thing that happens is that we were then a, a news media team were flown onto the ship from uh, independent television news. Um, and uh, Michael Nicholson was the reporter. He's quite famous here in the UK. Very experienced, particularly actually reported. I do believe, you know, some very incisive reports during the days of Vietnam, um, you know, from the U.S. Embassy and so on, uh, and his cameraman Eugene Campbell. Um, mixed blessing, um, and and uh, um, you know, you know, because the presence of media, and you know, and if there are some, you know, p- people still in the services out there listening, um, just be and media involved in your become almost intrinsic to your daily day to day operation. It's be very circumspect how you how you handle the media and what you volunteer to do and so on. Um, it's got huge positives and certainly to project you know the image of a of a you know of a, of a service you know and the job that you're doing and and so on. But sometimes presence of media can can make you almost do things that you are expected to do in order to service the me potential media story. Um, yeah, and, sure. you know, I might come back to that. But if, you know, I'm, I really do hope that there are, you know, junior pilots and air crew observers, navigators out there, um, you know, who, you know, when you do, you know, they are thirsty for impactful images and impactful statements and so on. Be very careful how you service that appetite, their appetite, yeah. you know, for which they're paid, you know, they, they have to make a... Um, you know, their news channel is paying them to get, you know, good stories. Do not let them disturb your the way that you've almost in your own head plotted out how um, how things should go in terms of 
and I think, you know, especially when it comes to your own personal view on what you've just done, if you have come to the point where you've actually killed someone. Are you supposed to be jingoistic, saying Yahoo, or are you supposed to be reflective or indeed a little bit shocked in terms of I've just taken somebody's father away or somebody's son or somebody's you know, wife or daughter or, or whatever? And, and I think this is also something that needs to be thought through maybe before they arrive or before you even speak to them. And maybe some help there from, you know, service advisors, i.e. in the Navy or Air Force or whatever, advisors on how to handle media and not be ambushed for their thirst for stories. Yeah, well, that certainly becomes a, a training event for people nowadays as they deploy. They, they get a lot of uh, how, to, how to deal with the media. I wish I'd had that, Brian, um, because <laughs> because in the a lot of it, a lot of the engagement with media, especially with the cameraman was was hugely positive. It has to be said, he flew with us quite regularly, even in battle conditions. Um, you know, he actually spotted a couple of mines himself, which was which was really good. But actually, even when we started our missile attacks in the North Gulf, um, Eugene Campbell came with us, and he, you know, um, he was a valued member of the crew when he flew with us, um, passing us, you know, lemons lemon sodas through from the back of the aircraft from the cool box. <laughs> um, no, but more than that, a very, very good, good, um, a very good pair of eyes. But there is the other imperative here, which is a positive projection on how professional, and I, I'm sure your last point about, you know, training, you know, now it seems to be a lot more of a mature aspect, is positive aspects of how to project the values of modern service life and servicemen and women's commitment you know to defend the principles and the rights of people you know the values of their country and so on and there is no better way than, than actually projecting those through these wonderful ambassadors we got and we got thousands of them and they're called service men and service women um so so that shouldn't be understated but i think the way that one reacts with the media should almost be a, a you know in, like an it's an individual analysis that each person should make and I and I think, and well, I, I will go through it now. But when I came back from the first successful attack of the uh, that Flory and I did against a T forty three and a TNC forty five, and and these were this was an attack on um, January the thirtieth, um, way north of the ship. And I'll come back to how we operated in a minute. Is we rejoined the Gloucester. And of course, there waiting was, you know, the cameraman um, saying, you know, how, you know, landed on, douche, shut down. I was desperate for a cigarette. Um, <laughs> um, and then the, um, the cameraman, you know, did, did his bit, you know, and, and said, well, how, how does that feel? The actual mm. answer I should have given is the one how I actually felt, which is absolute, you know, I absolutely don't know. I really do not know. After all of that anticipation, a, an unsuccessful attack the day before, you know, reducing confidence in our weapon system and, you know, well, it was a sort of unsuccessful attack, but we can go into that later. But then you have this, this thing about, you know, but then you just feel as though you should be, yeah, we, you know, it's good to see the missiles go and, and things like that. And that was a front. It was a almost like a, 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 you know, some kind of victory front, you know, to say, yeah. pow, we got them and all of that kind of stuff to inspire people. Actually, I don't think I knew how I felt at all. No, that's true. That's a yeah. lot of a lot of emotions that you're going through and if you've had no experience with it, you know, it, it's kind of you know, a tough situation when somebody asks you that because it's one of those things again that you're not really prepared to to discuss. You need some time to kind of think about it and reflect and yeah, like, and maybe maybe a cigarette. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, um but but the you know, maybe it's one of the things, maybe they do because uh, Brian you said that, you know, they you now get media training for a lot of people is 
is, you know, some of the context of that is, you know, try and work out, you know, you are going to feel something really different when you have come to the point in life when you have taken other life. Even though it's legal, even though it's fully allowed in the rules of engagement and all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, and, and if you don't kill them, they're going to kill you, which in, in some respects was, you know, um, about right. Um, but it's something that, that uh, again, uh, you know, some advice is just maybe think through how would you feel, you know, when you when you when you've done that, just so you're armed for the time when it has happened. And you actually say, yeah, actually, I, I think this aligns with my expectations and so on. But anyway, so I, I spent a, a bit of time, I guess, on, on the morals, but we must come to January the 17th. We got this tactical cooperation working with with the SH-60s. And then, of course, the talks all breaking down and, you know, da, 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 da. And it was um, late in late in the evening um, of Jan 17. Um, oh, sorry, no, it was late in the evening, Jan January the 16th. And, and of course, here we go, normal time zone problems. OK, so so on January the 17th, and um, maybe I'll read my diary entry on the outbreak of war. And this is um, January the 7th, my entry for January the 17th. At 01.42 hours this morning, I saw the start of the war. I watched as I sat on a bollard on the starboard side of the flight deck, as USS Fife, Missouri, Wisconsin and Roberts fired a salvo of tomahawks. It was a clear, starlit night a cloudless sky, beautiful, so clear. The missiles launch were beautiful too, but the two were incongruous. I'm certain that I saw a part of history last night, the first blur of a terrible war. It was a strange feeling, a sense of failure, a question mark on the sense of humanity. I said prayers last night as I sat on that bonnard. I prayed for all of the people who are going to be hurt for all the people who are going to die. I said prayers for my wife and for my children, and I finished with, and I finished with, and may God have mercy on our souls. As those missiles sped away with a time of flight of some hours, I thought that away in Iraq, many miles away, there are people who are going to die by those missiles. They do not know it, and the missiles cannot be recalled. I have no sympathy with the Iraqis as a nation, but I have sympathy, sympathy with humanity. Tonight I watched more missiles go, and may God have mercy on their souls. And it was just a stunning night in terms of the sea was flat calm. You could see dimmed navigation lights of the American ships in a line for about five miles. You could see for miles and the, the biggest panoply of stars that I've ever, ever witnessed. Um, the sky had cleared. There was no haze. Um, and these missiles then firing off into. So you see that the booster rocket of the of the of the Tomahawk, you know, the uh, land attack missile, you know, as they you know, light up the local, um, the vicinity of the firing ship. Of course, in those days, UK didn't have tomahawks. So, um, and then speeding away, and then another one, and then another one from further down the line, and, you know, and so on. And, and then over the top were the squadrons of the fixed wing um, with their navigation lights as they went over the top of us. And at that stage, we were somewhere around 120 miles south in the Gulf, south of the line of Kuwait City. So essentially just north of Bahrain. Um, and then you just and, and you just think this this is this is it. It's happening. Can't be recalled now. And um, uh, this is the war starting and I'm going to have a role in it. But and here was the point to begin with. Florian and I and the other Lynx aircrew from HMS Cardiff, who were on the other side of this cordon, for the first couple of days, um, we were um, 
tasked with nothing more than mind search. <laughs> and here we have this potentially highly armed, fairly long range, you know, um, you know, thing. We've practiced with the SS, USS Bunker Hill and, you know, with a tactical, um, uh, you know, a, a, you know a con op uh, that, you know, has worked in practice. And we were still doing blinking mind search. So um, I took the um, uh, took the um, uh, opportunity to go for a liaison visit. And I can't remember the ship. I think it might have been still Bunker Hill. But what I did was a was a loadout, a full loadout, and it, and it was illegal loadout. I'm sorry to say, but I'm not sure if the naval authorities will come knocking on my door so long after this. But an illegal loadout of um, the so we had two sea skewer missiles on. Oh, that was on the port side. A heavy machine gun pod and a yellow veil on the starboard side. A general purpose machine gun in the starboard door. Chaff and flare dispensers, um, wherever we put those on the um, on the fuselage and on the tail, uh, you know, and the whole thing, you know. And then I flopped this rather, you know, uh, for a liaison visit, you know. And then went, down, I'm sure it's Bunker Hill, and they then went down and said, you know, knock, knock, knock. Um, what's happening about our, um, uh, what's happening about our, you know, wonderful. Um, you know, tactic that we, we've kind of invented. Um, and then they say, well, if we can get back to you, but would you like to come up to the bridge, to the conning, you know, position, because we're just about to launch another cruise missile and you might want to have a look, <laughs> you know. So that that was interesting. And the other thing about that visit as well, Brian, was, oh, my word, the to go the comparison of the Type 42 destroyer, HMS Gloucester, my ship, and the operations room, of an Aegis class, class cruiser was just absolutely stunning. You know, I'm afraid to say that if there's one thing, guys, you do well in the United States, you put a good operations room together, um, and it was amazing. Uh, you know, and the way the, your your um, situational awareness of hundreds of miles and, you know, what everything, anything moving in the air, you know, absolutely, absolutely stunning. Um, but anyway, so it was um, uh, um, a uh, um, uh, when do, I'm just looking for a um, right. So it was actually um, a few days after um, when suddenly um, we were tasked to right. Okay, you've proven your point. Here's from anti-surface warfare commander guy called Commodore Forbes, I think his name was, um, you know, to Gloucester. OK, off you go then. Uh, load up and go for a patrol. And while you're up north, do you know we've got some interesting frigates and, and um, I'm going to try and remember, Leftwich, Nicholas and Kurtz, who were the combat search and rescue frigates who are kind of, um, you know, in, in the northern oil rigs, you know, uh, and they were there to drag out any pilots uh, that, that sort of kind of, came fixed wing pilots that, that sort of, um, you know, e evaded. And their, their first thing, get over the North Persian Gulf because we got some people come and pick you up. <clears throat> um, and so so that was it. Um, and so just by that sort of, as, as it were, catalytic visit to the anti-surface warfare commander saying, oh, yeah, come for it. You know, you showed me your bridge. This is my blinking airplane. Look at the missiles. Look at the guns. So, no, we can do stuff. Um, and then a couple of hours later, OK, go do your stuff. And that was just the big break that I think that we needed in the in the Lynx community to say, hey, look, we are serious. We've got some stuff and we can be on patrol. You know, we've got now we've got gas in the north part of the Gulf through those three frigates. We've got long light loiter time. And the longest trip I did um, rotor stop to road uh, because we can do hot refueling. Um, which the um, our good American colleagues and their ground crews were happy to do um, was from getting into the airplane to getting out of the airplane seven hours forty five. Um, mm. Yeah, that's that's the same as a transatlantic flight, London Heathrow to. <laughs> um, and I must tell you, I was bursting for a, for a natural break after that. Um, but there we go. 
Um, so, so you know, Brian. So, so we we we've broken the mold, and and then the links, very often working with the SH sixty and with the combat search and rescue frigates north, providing us gas, you know, to remain on, to remain on task, uh, work work really really well. Uh, and and we did these missions time and time again. Um, you know, nothing nothing there. A few kind of. In, in, interesting things. I remember on the first day, actually back to mine, mine search day, um, is Flory and I were transiting back from a, a logistics run to another uh, Royal Navy ship. We actually had an Arab Dow surrender to us. Yes. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how we escort them into harbour, uh, but there we go. But yeah. it, was, it was all amazing stuff, new experiences going on. You know, and a lot of this, you know, the other the other stuff was, you know, getting used to the the weather in the north, part, you know, part of the Gulf, a lot of haze and so on. Um, and nothing happened. You know, lots of aggressive patrolling, getting into a routine, servicing, you know, an extra links coming up from the second echelon through the Gloucester, and then to follow us up, trying to get a Ripple Three going, where we'd have a link somewhere around the North Gulf during daylight hours. Um, you know, throughout. But anyway, nothing happened until then. Um, all of a sudden, this is where the big breakout happened and the, the Battle of Bubian kicked off by the the, the, the incursion, the Iraqi incursion um, at Kafshi on the 29th of January when there was a convoy of, a, I think, 17 ships that, that suddenly sprung out of the, the port, like Ashwaiba port on the, you know, um, on the east coast of Kuwait. And, and they were doing this like little... Not quite sure what it was there for, but this little firefight down in Al Kafshi, um, you know, and and there, um, and working with Brazen Flight, who was staging through the, the Gloucester, um, we, we came into our first sea screwer action by um, uh, against a, a line of relatively small boats, and they were nothing more than boats, um, 17 of them, and uh, Brazen and I. Uh, both in turn had a go at one of the bigger ones, and Brazen's missile went, um, I'm afraid, did not function properly. And mine ditched um, just a, probably a few yards just in front of the target, which was about halfway down the queue, as it were. And, and I think what happened, I, I set it on the lowest setting, um, and I think probably of, of about three feet. Uh, skim height, and I think it probably hit the wake of a preceding boat, but enough and close enough, probably to have create, uh, created shrapnel tra- damage to 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 the target. But there was a disappointment that it hadn't actually worked. The next day, I think, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, January thirtieth was the opening of the of the the big day of you know the, the Battle of Bubian, which I think people say really was the January the thirtieth and thirty first, starting with a. An engagement by the uh, by the HMS Cardiff links uh, up north. Unfortunately, I was in the middle of a, a very brief um, uh, a very brief uh, maintenance routine on my gearbox, which delayed our launch because it was. I thought, oh my god, you know, here here they go. Luckily, that delay then meant that Flory and I um, didn't get up to um, didn't get up um, to um, the north, and I'm just. Sorry, there's a just a reference I need to, um, until a little bit later on in the morning, um, and um, uh, and we we were sort of um, we were we were slightly sort of uh, not vexed or angry, but you know somebody somebody got the uh, um, um, so this was um, uh, on the thirtieth, and I'm trying to at eleven twenty in the morning. Um, when we, Flory on his radar again, working, you know, visibility not very good, working hard against uh, Anaprop and stuff like that, you know, said, Oh, I think I've got something. It was something that was in addition to the, the one good thing that we could, was with our previous patrolling very close to Iraq and Kuwaiti shore, we, we really built up a really good knowledge about what the environment looked like, where the rigs were, where the line of boys were, where the Sea Island terminal, where the tankers used to take on, where they all were. And it would almost, you know, when something was not right, it stood out very well. And Flory said, there's something coming, you know, there's something strange here. So so we kind of, you know, sneaked into this new contact, which he, he'd identified. 
um i say this was kind of um you know what was it it was uh 11 20 in the morning on the 30th um and um so we sort we sort of piled in there um you know to, to have a look i suppose the you know the the visibility where you could actually you know make out things was probably three to four miles and in front of us there was this this boat and it was a um uh, a T T forty three minesweeper mine hunter this is what the Iraqis have been using for laying mines, not sweeping them, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> and um, so we got the you know we we got the flash flash flash. This is four one zero. That's the aircraft night side number. You know hostile this this position request weapons free because our rules of engagement were then still you know weapons tight or you know weapons tight, which means you have to get authority from you know the mm -hmm. the surface warfare commander purely because you know to reduce the the um the possibility of blue on blue and so on right. and and so you know while we got the while flurry got you know i got the aircraft back out to you know that comfortable firing range from about six miles and um then um the um then it came through um uh which was um uh, you know, you have you have weapons free that target. Uh, um, and sorry, I just oh. and the um, so we uh, then sort of kind of turned in, uh, got everything all sort of kind of locked up. You know, da -da, there we go. There that that's what the target was, um, and it was okay. And on came armed, you know, master arm and safety switch on, armed, lock ready, fire. <laughs> Uh, you know, mm -hmm. and Flory fired the missile. There's this kind of half a second wait as everything sort of kind of, and then the, a little shake of the of the backside as the thing falls off the pylon. You know, the aircraft rocks mm -hmm. side to side, and then this you know whooshing sound. You know, and then because of our failure the the day before, um, you know where where the missile well sort of failure you know, where the missile had sort of impact. There's this you know. Oh, is it going to? Is it you know? And we we put it, I think, on a, a mid you know a mid sort of height of about sort of five feet skim height. You know, give give it a bit of chance. And the problem about that is is as the missile went off the launcher and we saw it head off with its booster rocket in that fur, uh, it was going in the wrong direction. Because as <laughs> as as um as we came out of the as we came out of the you know the uh, the haze, I saw a boat, I saw a ship, you know, in front of me, and then um, um, I'm just going to have to, uh, to, to, to go. Uh, I saw a ship in front of me, you know, and I thought that's where the missile is supposed to be heading. And the missile was heading to the right. And I, I thought, no, it's got to turn, it's got to turn. It was about 10 degrees off, maybe less. Oh, come on, no, no, oh, no, please. You know, and I looked to the right to where the missile was heading, and there was another boat. There was another ship. Hmm. And the missile was heading towards a TNC 45 um, fast corvette, Exocet armed uh, corvette, fast patrol hmm. boat. It wasn't one target, it was two. And, and Flory had just locked up on the most obvious blip, I guess. And the missile then went off to um, uh, uh, hit the TNC forty five, and then we got a you know flash flash. We have the second a second target request weapon three that came very very quickly, um, and then um, you know round we went and within and I'm just looking at the timings here four minutes we had hit two major surface units of uh, the. Um, of the Iraqi Navy, or you know, some uh, the TNC forty five was ex Kuwaiti Navy, uh, which were being sort of pirated by the Iraqi Navy. So four minutes, mm. two major units down. Okay, no weapons. Okay, went back. Um, then the long haul, um, and um, back one hundred and twenty miles back to the ship. Um, and I got a, a comment about that. I could could make. The long haul back to the ship to rearm, and you know that's when I had this thing with the media. You know this this false interview with the media. Yeah, I feel great. It was fantastic to see the missiles go in 
actually I needed a bloody cigarette, sit down and actually just summon myself together about what I'd actually done. Never mind. We rearmed, had my I'd had my cigarette, rearmed, went, went north again. Um, and at um, uh, so at 1555, um, or shortly before half past three, a good old SH60 came out of the um, uh, uh, came out of the ether and said, "You know, four one zero, are you available? You know, stand by with our you know TACOP five four or something." To which said, "Yeah, available, armed with two. And um, so he said, "Roger, um, you know, I, we think you we, we see you. You know, using the wonderful avionics on, on a Seahawk." Uh, we see you, uh, you know, head now, you know, and he gave me, you know, gave us all sorts of vectors, you know, you got, you know, 10, this is absolute, we'd actually nailed this tactic, you know, 10 miles to run, you know, and so then Flory started to look at, you know, getting master arm safety switch to live, you know, digga, 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 which missiles we use, let's go for the left hand one, you know, whatever, um, um, and, you know, at, at six miles and, um, you know, and we it, we did exactly what we did, you know, at eight miles, couple of you know, a couple of paints on sector scan. Yep, got it. And then you know, coming into six miles, you know, straight almost straight into a lockup, um, and then fired the missile. And and I have a picture in my wall now, a painting of, of that that uh, that engagement. And we fired a missile that hit its bridge. Um. Mm. You know, twenty. You know, thirty seconds later. So that was our third in in two hours. And then there's one of these things here, um, Brian, and it's about the morality. And there is something I did then that that I reflect upon to this day. <clears throat> I fired one of the two missiles, and basically it blew the front of the bridge away. That TNC-45, because that's what it was, was, as a fighting entity, finished. You know, mm -hmm. um, the bridge had gone. Well, what's behind a bridge? Normally the operations room or very close to it. It was gone. What I decided to do then was to go round and hit it again. Mm. And I do not know why I made that decision. Because I, there was a possibility, we still had one missile, that there could be other ships out there. You know, maybe the Oza, the, the one Oza-class fast patrol boat, ex, you know, Russian design, that, you know, one of these ships did escape into Iranian hands at the end of the day. And I, and I still do not know why I chose to re-attack when, in essence, that patrol boat as a fighting entity was done well i think that happens a lot i think i think engagements yeah okay but the second natural. yeah the second the second missile and and here we have you know something you know which, which is I, I don't know how, how this story the second missile went into the dark didn't go as uh, you know to the bridge it went into the direct midships for you know, direct midship. So halfway down the boat, the ship or corvette or whatever you like to call it. And the second missile, and we saw it black, you know, with a black splodge, you know, and, you know, bruiser, that's the name for a, you know, air to surface missile, bruiser hit, you know, which we radioed in. Um, now, a few years later, I, and as I say, the T TNC 45s were, were stolen from the, the, um, Kuwaitis. I went to Kuwait on on a uh, on a diplomatic mission a few years later, um, and there was still some TNC, the TNC forty fives. You know, some of them had not been harmed during the war, but actually come back. And I went for a a visit into the TNC into a TNC forty five. People had known what I'd done, and I'd say, "Oh, let's see it from the other end." Now, the the place where that second missile hit was the dining hall area and you know here's the here's the next thing when your ship goes to emergency stations now okay i'm saying a trained ship here not one 
manned by a hodgepodge of people, not very professional, right. which is probably right. People assemble, um, you know, in specific areas to do things like, you know, break out firefighting gear and stuff like that. The, the general area mm -hmm. that you go uh, is, you know, normally somewhere like a junior rates dining hall, like a like the ship's dining hall. And then we come back to this, this moral thing of the ship was a spent force. The second may well have impacted an area where people had gathered in order to save themselves. And that's a difficult one. I, I would love, I mean, Brian, you know, I would love challenges via your website or any comments, you know, to, you know how other people, how how other people may may feel in that same situation if you think i'm wrong um and, and if you think i'm taking an over moralistic attitude i've got no apologies but it's just that's where some of these in sort of incidents leave you yes so yeah. thought I, well, I think it. with with age you know is going to come reflection and on on these things and you know it's easy to look back and say well i should have done this or i shouldn't have done that you know, I, I can totally understand it, though, because in your mind, I'm sure at that time, it's the the point of this procedure is to sink that ship, is to remove that ship from play. And I would be willing to bet at the time you probably you probably knew that the bridge was hit. But at the same time, it didn't register that I've taken the ship out of commission. Yeah. You know, that it's no longer a threat. It's more like, well, the ship is still there. Yep, we've hit it, we've, we've damaged it, and but maybe it hasn't blown even up. we've crippled it, it but it, it's not it's still there. It's That's not broken right. in half and so. on its way down. Very valid yeah. point, Brian. So, but it's just it's just um, as you say, over the length of time and you yeah. know, and there are many things about morality of war and everyone has their own perspectives and um, you know, sometimes I, I guess you self challenge and so on. Well, and I think that's healthy because I, I think I worry about people who don't. I worry about people who have gone through that and don't look back at the times that they engaged and question, well, did I have to or should I have? You know, because because I know people that they're they're completely guilt free about everything that they ever did. I, I wish I could feel the same. Like, you know, you still look back and say, well, maybe that one I shouldn't have done it or maybe I could have done it differently or or, you know, just like you're saying, did I do more than I needed to? Um, so, I, you know, I think that's healthy. I think that that at least demonstrates that um, you didn't lose your humanity to it. Right. Which I think with I think some people can. Yeah. Yes, that's the that's that's the conflict. You know, the the the, the, the thing about war is it's 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 it is very human based. You're trying to kill people. But anyway. Right. The next day, <laughs> January the 31st, um, was um, the second day, essentially, of the Battle of Bubian, in my, you know, how I see the Battle of Bubian. Um, and uh, Florian and I were airborne once more. And then a sort of call came in through HF radio from our ship. You know, um, we were just doing our normal, you know, search and attack sort of kind of profile. And a uh, call came in. Uh, from our ship, 120 miles away, saying, uh, you know, 410, standby retask. Uh, Roger. Um, uh, request nature retask. Combat search and rescue. Ah, now this is for something uh, to which um, uh, the first thing Florian and I thought was overland combat search and rescue, like there's a down pilot somewhere mm -hmm. and we've got to go and sneak in and you know, go and, you know, lift up someone who's popping smoke and <laughs> some stuff. Never done that before. Okay. But anyway, adaptability <laughs> is the key to air power. We know this, uh, Brian. Um, and so um, this was combat search. And, and the thing was, overnight, some survivors of the ships that had been sunk on the day before, and HMS Cardiff similarly had successes against other ships as well. Some of these survivors got into kind of life rafts and, and floated down to a uh, an oil terminal you know, out at sea, one of these big sort of frameworks which tankers come and moor alongside and they pump oil on board. Um, and these Iraqis have been found on this, uh, you know, sea, sea terminal. Um, and we had to provide anti-surface, uh, you know, well, cover uh, because there was some SH, is it Sea Kings, SH-3Ds 
um, mm -hmm. from the combat search and rescue frigates, and they just needed a, almost like a shotgun just to be in the in the area. Oh, you know, but these were our friends. You know, we've worked with them before. This was fine. Um, and you know, as soon as we determined that we weren't, weren't going to have to go a hundred miles inland to pick out a um, you know a sort of uh, uh, F-15 Eagle pilot or something like that. You know, <laughs> this was okay. We're still over the water here, uh, Flory. We're, we're good. And, and so we arrived on the scene at the Mina Al Bacha um, sea oil terminal. And um, one of the, uh, there was an SH-60 and I can't remember which one it was, but it, it was, um, <clears throat> you know, are there any um, contacts um, that you want us to investigate? And the answer back from the uh, SH-60 was uh, negative. Um, we're, no, we're good. So <clears throat> Flo and I decided we, we'd go between the CO terminal and the threat direction, which is, you know, obviously we went north and, yeah, and uh, we were in fairly overt, um, you know, radar uh, discipline then. And uh, Flory quickly sort of picked up a sort of, oh, hello, got something here. And got the sort of confirmation there were well there are no friendly units in the area and we can't see any threats anyway so we we headed up towards and out of the gloom again visibility not very good as we were we you know closing in on the target it was another tnc 45 and it was underway and so we we called you know we called it straight away to the on-scene commander and said you know flash 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 um, you know, TNC forty five. It was about twelve miles north of the um, uh, north of the the sea oil terminal, and immediately, brilliant. That's what you need. Immediately, weapons free that target. Ah, oh, didn't have to refer back to anyone else. This was a couple of people in a gang who understood a local commander. You know, not some commodore or admiral sitting back in HQ somewhere. Bang, yeah, you got it. Need to take it out. And we went in and they also said, we're bringing in the fixed wing. And the fixed wing mm -hmm. being an A6, is it A6 intruder? Isn't it A4? A6. A4 is a Skyhawk. A6 intruder from one of the yeah, carrier A6 air wings. <clears throat> and then there was a, a sort of, um, I th in, in the, the best way to just, it wasn't a race. But anyway, we sort of kind of um, uh, got ourselves... Um, all sorted out. We we opened out, did our normal six, you know, eight mile run in six miles. You know, give me three hundred, um, and um, we didn't see the first missile go in. But then mm -hmm. we turned back again. We we had two missiles still, so we 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 set up a profile for the second, and we delivered. And the, we saw the missile hit the ship with a you know the the black thing, just as the A6 was going overhead doing its targeting run. <laughs> so beat there, him beat him to it. Was it a race? Well, in the end, it shows you how on-scene rotary can really, really actually get its act together quite quickly. Um, you know, so, uh, and, I, and I understand that he then went back to um, essentially finish the job with a a few sort of rock eye, whatever they're called, BLU twenty fours or something. Maybe not. Um, mm -hmm. But that was the um, so that so that was the and that was the final engagement of, of that phase. <clears throat> we actually found ourselves um, just at the end of the, the the clearing operation on the rig, uh, a little bit short of petrol, um, and um, it was very good that one of the combat search and rescue frigates actually came out of its cover to come and collect us. Okay, okay close the range between. Um, my aircraft and, and you know where uh, the ship was um, you know that was my gas station a little bit low, low on petrol yeah. and it was really good to see um, uh, the, the, the break, break colour so so I think you know so this was the um, um, everything un unfolding um, uh, it was essentially the end of, of the um, uh, the um, the Battle of Bubian, I think that engagement. There were others. Um, it didn't go all one way, and I, there was, there is, um, there's an online resource that pretends to recount, you know, various, you know, maritime battles. Um, I'm not going to name it because everyone will then Google it, but they got most of it wrong. <laughs> 
um, and I and I've got the official documentation, the operations log to prove it. Um, but but um, the next day, however, this is where um, you can get really suckered into overconfidence uh, and so on. And and it was on that night of January the thirty first that um, the Allies um, declared air supremacy in the North Persian Gulf, i.e. not air superiority, where there's still a bit of a threat and, and stuff like that, but this is about air um, supremacy, where you're, you're fine, free and easy, you can go where you like, you're fine. Um, the next uh, day, uh, February the 1st, um, was a... Um, uh, Flori and I found ourselves in the North Gulf, I think our second sortie of the day, um, in the Northern Gulf, um, having fueled up again from, from very kind United States Navy assets. And we were heading, uh, you know, towards the scene of action of, of the previous two days. The sun was getting fairly low in the sky. So it was sort of late afternoon to the west. And... Um, uh, I said to, to fly, you know, almost like a, you know, official, okay, we're getting into uh, enemy territory here. Um, uh, enhance our lookout, you know. Okay, it was a little bit of a, you know, and of course, you know that we have our standard lookout, you know, that the pilot on the right-hand side will look straight forward, then sweep through the horizon to, to the right, and then over the top, you know, that's the standard lookout. So, so, Rather jokingly, I commenced our, you know, as it were, out of ground school, out of flight school lookout. And as I swept through over the canopy, uh, you know, over the top went a whole bunch of rockets. And I then jerked my head to the right. And there was all this splashing in the sea and some black smoke and stuff like that. And, you know, we'd been bounced from our left hand side out of the setting sun. Flory couldn't see a thing. And so, of course, the first thing is whack straight into you, you comb, as you know, you comb the line of fire. OK, so you're pointing directly into where the rockets came from. And we could not see a thing uh, because of the blinding, you know, the, the sunshine. So it went hard left again. And I have to say, you know, just the, the lever was was close to my armpit. The left foot was <laughs> sort of hitting the nose cone uh you know and uh you know and the nose was pushed firmly to the to the floor as we were heading off at you know what we could best do at about, about 150 knots um I, I completely forgot to dump the missiles because that would have made us go even faster and then we then said right okay we're gonna have to turn around and see if we, you know okay i'm gonna turn left we're going to turn left. Okay, three, two, one, to go back and face what might still be on our tail. So three, two, one, and boof, nothing there. Hmm. <clears throat> Hadn't got a clue, um, you know. And you know, again, the visibility wasn't very good, and and all of that kind of you know stuff, um, and um, total mystery. And I thought it was a blue on blue. Uh, quite hmm. honestly, I thought you know, there's some well-meaning. F-18 Hornet, you know, from United States, um, Canada, who, you know, we had a lot of people on cap those days, you know, um, uh, you know, and I thought, well, there we go. So we got back and reported it. Um, and it was really good because in that area, the, the cap was actually provided by uh, naval fixed wing operating from carriers. <clears throat> My understanding is that every aircraft that landed uh, back off cap Back on the carrier had a full audit of ammunition and whether the guns had been fired hmm. which is good nobody had fired anything and the next day an f-14 tomcat shot down a hind helicopter an iraqi hind helicopter in exactly the same place as we had our incident at the same time the day, day before hmm. sneaky so yes sneaky and and it was totally wrong to say air air supremacy uh, in my view. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, they always like to they forget about the helicopters. You know, they just focus on their their jets. Yeah, we you know, and you're, you're absolutely right, actually, Brian. And you know, the the way that um, uh, you know, sometimes you know the, the rotary wing are a little bit of a Cinderella squadron these days. I guess everyone looks at the you know the um, uh. 
you know, uh, you know, a wonderful you know, shipborne aviation. Lovely to see, by the way, that HMS Queen Elizabeth um, is now on deployment with her um, um, uh, with her aircraft group, which of which um, ten out of the eighteen fixed wing are provided by the United States. So the spirit, mm -hmm. the spirit lives on. But anyway, so I, I think that's. Um, um, I'll just tell you one final story because I think we've. We've we've run um, sort of uh, you know way way over time, but um, the the um, essentially you know in in advance of the um, uh, the ground assault on Kuwait, um, you know once again um, you know amazing U.S. U.K. you know collaboration there you know and, and others of course, um, um, but um, that there was the big convoy heading north. Which was just amazing to see um, two battleships mm. line line ahead. Is it that's just amazing? The Missouri and the Wisconsin, um, whole load of frigates, the minesweepers, the um, uh, the sort of the LPHs and so on. Big convoy, you know. And we basically did the same gig again of uh, you know search and you know attack missions, um, you know. But this time there wasn't the huge transit times. Of getting down 120 miles to the anti-air warfare, warfare barrier, so that that was you know pretty cool. But a call later late at night, um, uh, it's about two, two o'clock in the morning. On um, I will have to sort of consult the date, but um, we're we're now in sort of uh, heading towards the um, uh, end of uh, uh, towards. Oh, it was February the 16th. I just turned it up here in my diary. Um, <laughs> Um, yes, the diary entry runs, I made Saddam waste two SA-2 missiles early this morning. We were on our third run into target at 0115 hours when two SAMs were launched at us after a couple of seconds of lock-on. We were just south of Felaka Island. The target was a Polnokni between, a Polnokni lander craft between Felaka and Q8, and I made the tactical error not to be repeated of reattacking twice. Yeah, we had a we had a problem with lock up and all sorts of things uh, of, for our missile. The far the the fastest with the most is the first rule of war. Um, we were there. We launched. Well, um, oh sorry about that. That goes on to a, a, another matter. But what actually happened was it was we had real problems in locking up the the, the missiles, you know, onto this target. You know, in the dark, early in the morning, we were uh, actually being vectored around by a, a UK um, Nimrod airplane. Um, and uh, as our second missile, the first missile, we didn't see uh, impact. So as we launched our second missile, um, out from behind the target uh, came these these uh, two great big flares, which we thought to begin with were flares, but then the flares got bigger and bigger and bigger, and they, they were, came up out of the back end of uh, west end of, of uh, uh, Q8 City, because SA-2s are mm. land-based missiles. So there was a sort of, right, okay, time to forget our second missile. But of course, we did, you know, this should have been training together. You, 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 if it doesn't work, just go away and come back another time. <laughs> you know, don't, don't re-attack. How many pilots have been shot down re-attacking because the first one screwed up? I don't know. Oh, um, yeah. But lots, lots. Yeah. But anyway, so these SA two, so, so the so the first thing we did essentially was forget the missile which was in the air at the time, turn towards the Felaka Island where there was a brigade of Iraqis, uh, land troops, um, and start put out chaff and flares, um, and all the Iraqis saw that, so they they fired triple started firing triple A, uh, in in volumes at the general direction of us, but we were pretty well out of range uh, of just sort of, um, you know, machine gun bullets and half inch Brownings and things like that, you know, um, and even shoulder launch when, you know, I think we're still right, you know, and Flory was, you know, uh, you know, he said still tracking. And when I was heading in towards the first attack and also as we were being very helpfully, uh, um, you know, illuminated by the Iraqi, gave us our horizon, you know, to, to fly by. But then the second turn, when Flory said they're still tracking, I said, you know, mm. I decided to do another 90 degree turn and turned into complete darkness. So I'd gone from 
at a height of maybe 300 feet, um, I then turned into complete darkness. 300 feet visual to IMC, into, into the gloop. Um, the, the darkness and of course the, you know there was oh got to get on instruments here and the instruments all seem to be in the wrong order because there's also a, a couple of SA2s coming up if you when you're on instrument flight training Brian um, when they say right you know get on to when you, you're now IMC get on to instruments and you work out you know do they ever say, and just imagine you've got two SA-2 missiles up up your tailpipe right. here. You know, the answer is no. No, they don't, because you think you're mad. Yeah, but anyway, 200 feet above the water. And, and 200 the dark, feet yeah. in the dark, you know, and, and, you know, you, and, you know, you're still trying to put out chaff and flares and weird stuff, you know, and, and you know, and I whiz in, I guess you would say, an unknown position, a UP, you know, and I was trying to work out, you know, of course, you should go straight to artificial horizon, of course, and, and so on. And then this mm -hmm. tiny little bug light came on in the top right hand of the cockpit. Um, and the, the bug light was actually the low level light on the radar altimeter, which you can set to any pre-selected mm -hmm. height. And mine was selected for 30 feet. And the bug light came on and I saw it. And I just basically pulled into pulled in the path, you know, just pulled the collective mm -hmm. as a fight. You know, I didn't know whether it was to cushion the impact, then got a, a, a look at the artificial horizon, which was about 10 degrees starboard down and not bad, not far off level. And I reckon I probably missed the feet, uh, missed the water by 10 feet. And you guys weren't flying with goggles, right? No. Oh, goggles. Yeah. Um, God, there were some goggles around, but in those days, in maritime, they were they were for um, commando pilots, you know, for, for landing marines and so on. Uh, they had been used in the Falklands War, um, but then, um, uh, no, we didn't. But they do now. They, they do these days, you know, which is sure. obviously a lot better. But um, there was the... Um, uh, there was that that incident. Um, I have a I have an uncle who was killed in the Second World War. He was in the Coastal Command, um, and um, he did thirty missions off the coast of Norway, flying the Beaufort. Um, uh, and I I've always hailed this guy as my hero for some unknown reason or some intrinsic reason which I which I don't understand. Um, there is something in me that says that it was my Uncle Duncan that tapped me on the shoulder and drew my attention to that little bug light on the top right-hand corner of the instrument panel. Yeah. yeah. But that was, um, you know, essentially the, the you know, the, the, the last thought. I, I just say, you know, um, as we are sort of drawing, you know, towards the end, that... That time in the north part of the Gulf, you know, when we were getting ready for amphibious operations and all of that kind of stuff, you know, again, wonderful um, collaboration with uh, Kiowas and SH-60s and um, uh, Sea Venoms. Are they called Sea Venoms? The um, AH-1Ds? Um, uh, yeah, I think sea the, cobra. Yeah, they call sea, cobra. sea, yeah. sea cobras or cobras something like that. Yeah. yeah, still, you know, I mean, it, it was being, but by that time, all those oil, oil wells were on fire. There was no wind. At midday, you would look up, and in this darkness, you could just about discern the faint orb of the sun, and you and you everything stank of this blinking oil, and you would sort of kind of say, you know, that is a. Um, you know, it's almost the end of the world. This is a this is like a dying planet. Um, you know, in that mm. filthy oil, which is the oil in the air, the oil in the water. Um, but still, we kept to the task. Divers went diving. Mine clearance divers went diving in that stuff. I don't know how they did it. Um, <laughs> but essentially, the tanks went in. Iraq, you know, the Iraqi forces folded. Kuwait was liberated, um, and um, very quickly, really. It um it came to an end, um and um yeah, you know with it within a few hours, uh, you know my ship was tight. Gloucester was time late, um 
you know, it's supposed to be on its way home three weeks before. Um, you know, so little delay. So we went down to um, uh, Dubai. I think it was Dubai. And, um, you know, went alongside, you know, uh, to pick up the gear, which we'd had to land. All our personal gear had to be landed prior to the war, uh, just so it would reduce the, the Ministry of Defence's um, liability <laughs> to, to give me back my sort of um, clarinet and trumpet or whatever, uh, you know, certainly clarinet, um, you know, and um, uh, and that was, you know, when, you know, we were able to ring up our nearest and dearest back at home, you know, absolutely fantastic, amazing, um, and, um, and and then um, after a couple of nights of rather heavy partying, it has to be said, um, it was time to go home. So out we went, and 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 home we went. Um, we were on wartime servicing um, for about six weeks. Uh, we were doing the best we could in terms of keeping the aircraft going. Sometimes, you know, you just fill up the oil, fill up with petrol. It's probably good, Chief, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yes, boss. <laughs> um, you know, and you got um, just a tremendous trust in this team that you've built up and forged you know built up and then forged in in the in the in in a war um you know amazing amazing bunch of people and there were some people inside you know the ship as well that that were 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 equally good not all um but you know that's another story um <laughs> but then we sort of kind of you know we got outside our uh, outside into the you know the the Indian Ocean and the, okay chief let's have a look at the airplane now okay so we had flotation bags in the links um, they they you know sat on the back legs you know and these are of course the things when you just about hit the water you set off and they keep the links afloat for a, you know a little bit of time while the aircrew can make a uh, uh, an, an elegant and unhurried exit from the airplane um, if it hits the water. Um, and uh, we unloaded the, um, uh, we unfolded the, the flotation gear out of their sort of kind of the, the bag they live in, and both sides were absolutely full of holes. The, and this was just abrasion. Oh. This is just abrasion mm. as you're going. And on our our average height during the day, hundred. Well, it was uh, fifty feet and one hundred and forty knots. That's what we spent our life doing. Anything like 120 knots felt like almost like a like a pleasure trip um, to us, to, mm -hmm. to Florian and I. Um, we had cracks in the airframe, cracks, um, some suspect readings out of gearbox oil samples. And we were given five hours left. You, you're allowed to fly for five hours between there you are in the Indian Ocean and the day that you disembark back at um, Royal, Na Na Royal Naval Air Station, Portland. Um, and um, yeah, so we conserved those five hours, and and then of course you know back to um, um, the wonderful day of, of back with the families. Um, that last flight from Portsmouth, where the ship, where I left the ship, you know, as it entered into the dockyard, and I flew back with um, Flory and a few of the maintainers. That last hour back to Portland, I was almost flying as though I was on pins pins and needles, you know, almost saying, just don't go wrong. Just do, you know, yeah. nothing go, please just keep going, keep going, keep going for that last hour. And keep going it did. And landed at Portland. Um and there was my wife and children, um, and my parents, um to meet uh, uh to meet me back. Um Another amazing day. Well, I want to say thanks again to David for coming on to the show and telling us about his experiences in Desert Storm and all the uh, interesting details about the links and the weapon systems. The more I talk to guys who spend time in Desert Storm, particularly the Persian Gulf, the more interested I am in uh, all the things that were going on, the things that really didn't make the news. So it's pretty fascinating to learn all that stuff. And we're going to be sharing some more of that here with you real soon. Just a quick reminder that, of course, the comments made by myself, the guest, do not represent the Department of Defense or any private business. 
Appreciate you guys listening. We'll be wrapping up the season here soon. we got a couple more episodes in the works, and we'll be talking to you guys here in a couple weeks. Take care.